God is in the heavens, and he hath done whatsoever he pleased. The gospel of Jesus Christ testifies to the power of God in creation and salvation. God saves sinners by his free grace without the works of men. This program focuses on the truth found in the scriptures. We urge you to get your Bible, call your friends, and sit down and follow along with the teaching from God's word. Welcome to the Primitive Baptist Hour with Elder Dan Parker, pastor of Afton Road Primitive Baptist Church in Danville, Virginia. Here is the message for today. He had men under him. 
the Bible tells us that he was a devout man. Now this man was a godly man. If he was a devout man, he was a godly man. It tells us that he feared God. So he had reverence to the true God of heaven and earth. And he was a charitable man. He gave much alms to the people. The Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. So he was a cheerful giver. He gave alms to the people, to the poor. And then it says that he prayed to God all the way. Now, this man and his family had not heard the gospel. There are those that tell us that you have to hear the gospel and accept the gospel or accept Jesus who is presented in the gospel in order to become a child of God or to be born of God. But I believe that this outstanding uh, lesson would tell us different. And every situation in the Acts of the Apostles, every person that the gospel is sent to is already prepared in their heart to receive the gospel. That is, God has already worked within their hearts in order to receive the word. Because no natural man can receive the word. That is, those that are dead in trespasses and in sins cannot hear the gospel. They cannot receive it. It's an impossibility. But here we have a person that his heart is prepared. He is a devout man, a good man, a godly man, a charitable man, and a man that prays to God always. This man has to be a child of God. He must be. I've had those tell me, well, he wasn't a child of God right then until God sent him the gospel. But he had light, and he went by the light that he had. That won't hold water, will it? Because here is a man that fears God, and the Bible tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, so he had to have wisdom. The Bible also tells us in the third chapter of the book of Romans that there is no fear of God before the natural man's eyes. That they have all gone out of the way. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. But here is a man that has a quality and a characteristic of good. He is a good man. So he cannot be placed in the category of those that are dead in sins. He must be placed in the category of those that are alive by the Spirit of God. But he has not heard the gospel of Christ. No preacher has preached to him. Evidently, he is a proselyte of the uh, Jews' religion because he believes in the true God. He is not an idolater as some of God's people were before they heard the gospel, but he believes in the true and living God. He just doesn't have the knowledge of the Son of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of His redemption. But the Lord is going to take care of that. It says that as he prayed to God, he saw in this vision about the ninth hour of the morning an angel of God coming into him and speaking to him. Now God sends an angel and the angel speaks unto Cornelius and he was afraid. You know, that, that would be a frightening thing for an angel to come in and talk to you. I've never had an angel come in and talk to me. But it would be an outstanding experience for an angel to come and talk to you, wouldn't it? And he was afraid. 
But he knew that it was of the Lord. Or he says, what is it, Lord? And the Lord says, thine alms, or thy prayers, thine alms, are come up for a memorial before God. That is, I've heard your prayers, Cornelius, and he had an intercessor. Jesus Christ had to intercede for him because he is the only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. God looked upon him with kindness and favor. God heard his prayers. And God only hears the prayers of his children. So God honors his prayers because they have come up before a memorial before God. And the angel of the Lord says, Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Here is Cornelius about 40 miles north of Joppa. Uh, he's in Caesarea. Caesarea is on the coast. You can look at a map of Israel and you'll find that Caesarea is 40 miles, Joppa is uh, 40 miles south of Caesarea. And Peter is there in Joppa. Well, the angel says, send for one Simon Peter. You know, Peter is an outstanding apostle in the New Testament. Peter is commanded of the Lord to feed my lambs and feed my sheep. Now, the Lord meant to feed my lambs and my sheep wherever that I send you. But the Apostle Peter, in his mind, when the Lord said that, probably only thought the Lord was talking about Jews. Because Peter did not understand at that time that God had a people among Gentiles. You see, Jews would not have anything to do with Gentiles. Jews felt like that the Gentiles were just dogs. And that God wouldn't have anything to do with them. Peter didn't understand this at the time. But he's going to understand it because the Lord's going to reveal it to him uh, that when Cornelius sends these men to John to, to get the Apostle Peter, the Lord says by this angel, he will tell you what you ought to do. Now, there was something that Cornelius needed to hear and to do as a child of God. Well, first of all, he needed to hear the gospel. God's children need to hear the gospel. Not so they can be children of God, but so they can have the knowledge of their Savior and by having the knowledge of their Savior, walk in His way and do that which they ought to do. And the gospel tells us what Jesus has done for us. And it also informs us because of what he has done for us as his children, what we ought to do for him to honor him, praise him, and adore him. So here Cornelius sends his servants out the next day and they journey toward uh, Joppa. And Simon Peter is here, and the Bible tells us that he is upon the housetop. He went up there to pray, and, and it was about the sixth hour. And while he was upon the housetop, he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, that is, while they made ready uh, the dinner, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven open. Now, this was a, a wonderful experience. He fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened and he saw this vessel descending unto him as it were a, a sheet knit at four corners and it was let down from heaven to the earth. And in this sheet that was knit at four corners there were all manner of four-footed uh, beast of the earth and wild beast and creeping things and fowls of the air. Now we have a picture here. We have fowls of the air. We have the unclean beast. 
unclean animals in the sheet. Well, what did this sheet represent? What did these animals represent? It represented us. It represented the Gentiles. Because we were classified as unclean by the Jews. But the Lord says to Peter, He says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now the Lord gave him a commandment, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, Not so, Lord. Now Peter begins to argue with God. Can you imagine an old Baptist preacher arguing with God? But he did. He started arguing with God. He says, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath entered into my mouth. I haven't eaten any of any hog meat. I haven't eaten any of these unclean animals. I'm a Jew. But the Lord gave him this vision to show him uh, concerning the Gentiles that they were clean. He says, call not what I have cleansed. The Lord says, call not what I have cleansed, common or unclean. Now the Lord says, Peter, I've already cleansed these. Now how did the Lord cleanse these? Well, the Lord cleansed these by what He did for us upon the cross of Calvary. You see, they were not cleansed by the gospel because they had not heard it. But the Lord says, call not what I have cleansed. That's in the past tense. Now, a third grader ought to be able to understand past and present and future tense. But it seems like we've got preachers out here, they don't understand that. Because they're preaching that uh, it's by the preacher preaching that God's people are cleansed within their heart. But the Lord says, call not what I have cleansed. That is, I've already cleansed them. Call not what I have cleansed. And he had to do it upon the cross by his precious blood and the application of, by the Holy Spirit within their hearts. Cornelius, his family, and his friends were cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet they hadn't heard about it, but they're going to hear about it. The Lord has commanded Peter that you go and preach the gospel. And while he's in this trance, and while he, this was done three times, three times the sheep was let down from heaven. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times. He denied him three times. Sheep was let down three times. And while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, see, he still didn't really grasp what this meant. And he says, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius hath made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And, and the Lord said, and he thought on this vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. For I have sent them. The Lord says, I have sent them, Peter. So Peter gets down uh, from the roof and uh, he goes with them on the next day on their journey uh, toward uh, the house of Cornelius. And of course it tells us again that he was a just man, one that feared God, had a good report among all nations of the Jews, and was warned of God with a, by the holy angel to send for uh, Peter to hear the words from the apostle Peter. So they, they arrived at the house of Cornelius and and, and when Peter enters into the house, Cornelius, he falls down to worship Peter. Now it shows you he didn't have uh, the knowledge that he needed, all the knowledge that he needed, because he, he bows down to worship Peter. Now there are people that tell us that Peter was the first pope. Well, if that 
was true, then Cornelius would just, the Peter would have said, stand up. Cornelius, I myself am a man. He would have said, stand down there and kiss my feet if he was the first pope. Well, the truth of the matter is, he wasn't the pope. There's no hope in the pope. I'm telling you that right now. Peter was not the first pope. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ and a servant of God. He was a servant of the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter said, stand up. I myself also am a man. He said, I hear not to worship me. But the apostle Peter began uh, to, to preach unto him. And Cornelius related this experience unto him over again. Personally, how the angel of the Lord, how the Lord had visited him. And, and the apostle Peter says, of a truth. Now he understands this vision. He understands uh, the purpose of God in sending him to the house of Cornelius. He says of the truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with God. Peter says, I perceive of this truth that God also has his people among the Gentiles. That God is no respecter of persons. What he was saying here, that he not only has his people among the Jews, but he also has his redeemed among the Gentiles. That God is no respecter of persons in this sense. And therefore he says uh, unto Cornelius, uh, in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with God. How are we accepted with God? But by Jesus Christ our Lord. He has made us accepted with God. And then Peter begins to preach the gospel unto him concerning Jesus Christ who came into the world. About Christ being the man of God. Uh, going about doing good. That he was the son of God that He died upon the cross, that He arose from the dead. He preached the full gospel unto Cornelius, and for the first time, Cornelius is hearing an old Baptist preacher preach the gospel unto him and his family and his friends that he gathered together to hear the Word of God. And while Peter preached the gospel unto Cornelius and his family and his friends, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. Now the manifestation of the Holy Comforter has fallen upon them. As it did upon the church at Pentecost. Now, the Holy Ghost didn't regenerate people here. He had already regenerated them in their heart. But the Holy Ghost was manifest, poured out upon them... Uh, to, to give them the knowledge and the light that they needed through the gospel. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. The Holy Ghost, God, uh, was present with them. As the gospel was preached unto them, the Spirit fell upon them. And those that accompanied the Apostle Peter, that is the six brethren that he took with him, they were astonished as many as came with Peter because that all the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is, the Holy Ghost baptized these. And these Jews that were with Peter, they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Ghost was poured out upon these Gentiles. For they heard them speak with tongues. Now here is the gifts that was given unto them by the Holy Ghost. They, they spake in tongues, they magnified God, and they, answer, and, and they answered the Apostle Peter, or the Apostle Peter answered them. And he says, Can any man forbid water? Now he preached baptism, evidently. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well, as we. See, he's saying that we receive the Comforter at Pentecost. That, that is the manifest presence of God. And he says, these have received the Holy Ghost. That is the manifest presence 
of God. What doth hinder them from being baptized? Seeing that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon them as it was upon us. He says, can any man forbid water? That is, the Holy Spirit has witnessed that these are ready for the church to come in to the gospel church. They have received the gospel. They have believed the gospel. They have, they have believed in their Savior Jesus Christ. They believe what I preached unto them. Can any man forbid water? That these should not be baptized. He says that they should be baptized. And he commanded them to be baptized in water. That is, these children of God were to be baptized in water to identify themselves with the other believers in Christ that they believed in Jesus Christ. You see, baptism is an ordinance of the Lord. It doesn't wash away the filth of the flesh. It doesn't cleanse the flesh. It doesn't make people ready for heaven. It doesn't, uh, doesn't have anything to do with the new birth. But for those that have the Spirit of God within them, baptism is the ordinance that God has given to His children who believe the gospel for them to obey and be identified with the church. And so He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Baptism does not save us for heaven, but I do believe the Bible teaches that baptism does save a child of God right here in this world. Uh, those that have a good conscience, they should follow the Lord. They should follow the Lord because what the Lord has done for us. We should follow the Lord, not only in the ordinance of baptism, but we should follow Him in all the commandments that He has given us as His people because the Lord said to His disciples, If ye love me, keep my commandments. The proof that we love the Lord is that we keep His commandments. Now, keeping His commandments does not put the love of God in our hearts. But if we love the Lord, we should keep His commandments because God has commanded us to do it. Somebody says, well, if it's all by grace that I'm going to live in heaven and Jesus has died for me, why should I keep the commandments? Well, you should keep the commandments because God said so. If God says so, then we have an obligation to do it. I'm not going to argue with God. Now, you might want to argue with God, but I'm not. I'm not going to argue with Him because if He says do something, we should do it. And keeping the commandments is a blessing. Keeping the commandments produces a joy within our life. You see, God has given us His commandments because He knows what is best for us. Commandments are ordinances, are those things that God has said, this is what you ought to do. So Peter preached unto Cornelius and his house and friends this is what you ought to do. He commanded them to be baptized. Now, they had all the evidences. God had been gracious unto them. They were the redeemed. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. And I believe that they willingly obeyed Cornelius, his house, and his friends. I believe they willingly obeyed because they were so thankful of, of what the Lord had done for them and of the news that now they are hearing of Christ and His redeeming blood, His resurrection from the dead, of His intercession for them, that they, they happily and they obediently followed Him. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As the Lord gave commandment to His apostles that they should go out and preach the gospel unto the known world and baptize. You see, baptism uh, is for believers only. It's not for unbelievers. It's for believers only and only 
God's children are believers. Only God's children can be believers and are believers. Now, there's some people that say, well, I don't, I don't think baptism, I don't, I don't believe in baptism. That is, I don't believe in the mode of baptism. I don't believe you have to really go down into the water. I don't believe you have to be buried underneath the water. And there are those that would tell us that no, all you got to do is have a little water sprinkled on you, and that's baptism. Well, that's not baptism, that's sprinkling. Now, some of you may have in the past been sprinkled, but that's not baptism. Baptism is going down into the water. Now, that's the mode. That's not all that involves baptism. You've got to have the proper administrator and with the proper authority. I think I preached on this, you know, I don't know what it was, but I'm still going to preach on it. <clears throat> baptism not only is the proper mode, but it's also the proper administrator, one that has the authority to baptize and the proper subject is believers. The proper authority is the man that has come under the hands of the presbytery and called of God, who is a gospel preacher, has the authority of the church to baptize believers. And that's what the Apostle Peter had the authority to do from God, from the church, and they became members of the New Testament church when they were baptized by the Apostle Peter at this time. They became members of the church. Now, the church uh, was established there uh, at the house of Cornelius. Cornelius, his family, and his friends. It's a wonderful blessing for God's people to have the gospel preached unto them, and it's a greater blessing for them to obey it and to walk in it. For there is unspeakable joys in following the Lord Jesus Christ. There are blessings that we cannot count in following the Lord. Somebody says, well, I believe in salvation by grace, but, you know, I'm waiting for God to drag me up. No, God's not going to do that. If a person in their heart believes in Jesus, if they fear God, if they repented of their sins, if they love the Lord, then what are they waiting on? You know, what is holding you? Because, you know, the Lord's people, they don't need anything to hold them back. They don't need, need anyone to hold them back or anything in their life to hold them back from following Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is number one in our life. He's the one that paid the debt for us. He redeemed us with His blood. He loved us with an everlasting love. He has endowed uh, in our lives His bounties and His blessings. He has done all this for us. And why would we not burn within our hearts to do His will and to walk in His way? You see, Cornelius uh, is an example of for believers. It is an example for Gentile people who believe in Jesus to do what he and his family and his friends did when Peter preached unto them Jesus Christ and him crucified. They were baptized in water. Peter commanded them. You see, it's a commandment from God for his people to walk in his way. In the early church, we find that baptism was so important to the church, they would not baptize uh, unbelievers. They would not accept alien baptism, what we call alien baptism. They really, were not, they really were not baptized. They just got wet. You see, it was so important unto them, they would not accept uh, someone else's uh, what they call baptism because it was not gospel baptism. And, and the church, you can read in church history where the church was severely persecuted because of this. They were called Anabaptists. They were called Anabaptists because they would not accept 
those who did not believe salvation by grace. Salvation is of the Lord. And, and the practice of the church who was baptized by someone else, they would not accept that. Some of the greatest persecutions rose over the church standing firm that they would not accept alien baptism. That is because these children of God were not legally, scripturally baptized by the authority of the church, by the man of God, by the ministers of the Lord. And they were persecuted. They were some even put to death because of this. Severely persecuted. Somebody says, that's how important. Is that how important baptism is? It is in this, in, in this sense. Baptism is important. There's some people that believe that baptism is everything. That is, if you're not baptized, you're not going to make it to heaven. Well, that's not true. Some people that say that baptism is nothing. You don't have to be baptized at all. They, they discount the baptism altogether. But we believe that baptism is an ordinance of God and it is important for God's children who believe the gospel. It is important. It is an ordinance that God has given to the church for His children to openly confess that I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that He put my sins away. I believe that I am a child of God. And it is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our hope in Him that we're, we're going to die and we're going to be buried, but we're going to rise again. That's what baptism is a picture of. The death, burial, and resurrection. When you, when you join the church and you said... I want to follow the Lord. You are saying that I believe that He died for me. He was buried and He rose from the dead and that I'm one day going to arise from the grave. I'm going to be buried because I'm going to die except Jesus comes back before that time. And I'm going to, I'm going to arise in His likeness. When a child of God obeys this gospel, this ordinance that is in the gospel, he's, he's walking in the newness of life. He has, he has said, uh, I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of my way. And I want to walk in the Lord's way. You see, he separates himself. When we join the church, we separated ourselves from our ways. We separated ourselves from the old man. We separated ourselves from this world. We became identified with the church, with Christ. We took His name upon our lips. We took His name in our life. I took the name of Jesus Christ when I joined the church that He's my Lord and my Savior and only He will I worship and adore. That's what the child of God is professing. That's what He's saying. That's what uh, He is giving evidence to in his life when he follows the Lord. When we follow the Lord, we're saying a lot, aren't we? That everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If we name the name of Christ, let us depart from this world. The Lord says, come out from among them. He's talking to his people. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord says, I am holy. Be ye holy. That is, you walk in my way. You display uh, what I've done for you in your life. Be ye holy. I believe that God's children who separate themselves are a holy people. They are a chosen generation. They are a royal priesthood. Therefore, he who hath called you out of darkness, you should show forth his praises. Because he's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We should show forth the praises of him who hath done that for us. How good he has been to us. We should show forth his praises.
When you become a member of the church, you don't become a member part-time. You become a member full-time. We got enough part-timers. Uh, you become a full-time member. I want to be a full-time. That is, I, I want to be here. I want to be there. I want to be in the harness. I want to be in the yoke. Because that's where the God's people who believe in Christ should be and ought to be. You see, the gospel has told us what we ought to do. And that's what the Apostle Peter informed Cornelius. And that's what they did. And that's what we are to do. He is a good example for us, isn't he? What we should do as God's children in the church. May the Lord bless us to hold to the truths of Jesus Christ. Lift them up high. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of being an old Baptist. I'm not ashamed of being called a primitive Baptist. I'd rather be called one of them than anything else. I'm not ashamed to be, be called a, to be called a hard shelf that's in the right vein because, you know, if you're, if, if, you're, if you're holding to the light, if you're holding to the truth, you're not, you're not wavering. You're not, you're not being led astray. But we're walking in the way. The Lord has given us His Word, His Gospel, and how valuable it is. Sometimes we take it for granted. Right now, yeah. what we're hearing, what the Lord has, the treasure that He's given to us in the church, the Gospel, of Jesus Christ. How many of God's people don't have it? Multitudes of them. How blessed we are. Thank God for it. Thank Him every day. I'll tell you what, I, I try to thank God every day. Number one, that Jesus loved me and died for Him. That's the first thing. I thank God every day for uh, His grace in my life and being a believer in Christ. I thank God every day and that I'm a citizen of this country. I'll tell you, we ought to thank God every day that we have this land to live in. It's such a blessing. Thank God every day for the freedoms that we have to worship Him according to the dictates of our conscience. You know, I would fight for the right of any child of God to worship God any way they see fit as long as it does not harm someone else. I... I I would fight for their right, even though I don't agree with their doctrine or their teaching. I would fight for their right to do it. We have a freedom in this country of, of men can believe what they will. But I want, them, I want them to believe the truth. Because that is the will of God for His children to believe and walk in His truth. May the Lord bless us to hold to the line, hold to the truth.